This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 34. Coming up on Space Time. Revolutionary new images of a quasar. All systems are go for the maiden flight of the Vega C. And the final flight for SpaceX's Dragon 1 capsule. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have obtained their best view yet of a massive quasar blasting out from a monster black hole a third of the way across the universe. The new data reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics was collected by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, the same team which captured the first ever image of a black hole in the nearby radio galaxy M87. The new image is based on new data extracted from a distant quasar, catalogued as 3C279, located in a galaxy some 5 billion light-years away in the constellation Virgo. The study's lead author, Jae Young Kim from the Max Planck Institute, says the new observations have provided the finest detail ever seen in a jet produced by a supermassive black hole. The new analysis allowed the collaboration to trace the quasar all the way back to its origin, a monster supermassive black hole with a billion times the mass of the Sun. The image shows twin jets of plasma blasting out at some 99.5% of the speed of light from an ultra-luminous source of energy which shines and flickers as material swirling around an accretion disk is being crushed, stretched and torn apart at the subatomic level as it falls forever into the black hole singularity. The new data is allowing astronomers to follow the jet all the way down onto the accretion disk and to see the jet and disk in action. It shows that the normally straight quasar jet has an unexpected twist shape at its base and reveals features perpendicular to the jet that could be the poles of the accretion disk where the jets are ejected. The fine details in the images change over consecutive days, possibly due to the accretion disk rotating and the infall and shredding of material. Phenomena are expected from numerical simulations, but never before observed. To capture the image, the authors used a technique called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, which synchronizes and links a network of radio telescope dishes around the world. This allows all these individual observatories to act as if they were part of one single giant radio telescope dish, the size of the entire planet. It means the collaboration was able to measure features on 3C279 finer than a light year wide, the equivalent of someone on Earth resolving an orange on the moon. The findings are all part of an ongoing campaign to extract as much data as possible from the Event Horizon Telescope's observations. And as for that long-promised image of the black hole at the centre of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, well, hopefully, that's still to come. This is Space Time. Still to come on our program, all systems to go for the launch of Vega C's maiden flight, and it's the final flight for SpaceX's Dragon 1 capsule design. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. Okay, time now for a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. I know that being stuck in lockdown isn't fun. But you can make it work for you by using some of that extra downtime to improve your knowledge base. After all, that thirst for knowledge is why you're listening to Space Time. And that's why you really should consider checking out The Great Courses Plus. It's an incredible streaming service that lets you listen to thousands of lectures on hundreds of different topics from some of the very best professors in the world, people who are at the very cutting edge of their research, the ones actually writing the textbooks. And The Great Courses Plus isn't just about science. There are courses on a kaleidoscope of topics, from history, literature and business, through to practicing yoga, performing magic tricks, even learning how to cook. For example, our producer Hugh is learning how to play the guitar. And after he masters that, I've suggested he take up the tuba. Although his family aren't too sure about that one. The thing is, while you're stuck sheltering in place, you can use that time to explore and learn. And The Great Courses Plus allows you to continue exploring the world while staying at home, keeping your brain active and engaged. Now, a course that I've just checked out is called What Darwin Didn't Know, The Modern Science of Evolution. 
It's presented by Dr. Scott Solomon from the University of Texas in Austin. And the course examines the questions that we've answered since Darwin's time. What leads to mass extinctions? Why humans age? What gene editing is all about? And a lot more. You can watch or listen any time through the Great Courses Plus app. You can even stream videos onto your TV to watch as a family, keeping the kids learning while they're out of school. It's a great supplement to education for any age. And now's the perfect time to start. Because The Great Courses Plus has this great offer for space-time listeners. A free trial plus 50% off the regular price when you sign up for a quarterly plan. So check it out for free. And if you're not as impressed as I am, well, you've lost nothing. But in order to get this special offer, you need to use our special URL. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, by using that URL, you'll also be helping to support our show. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, you can find the URL details in the show notes and on our website, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now, it's back to the show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency says all systems are go for the maiden flight of its new Vega C launch vehicle. Now, as reported last week, the Vega C project is on schedule for launch this year, with all its stages now fully tested. The Vega C's first stage is a P120 solid rocket motor, the same type that will be used as one of the strap-on boosters fitted to the Ariane 6, which is also slated to take its maiden flight later this year. The P120 underwent a full 140-second hot-fire test at the Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, delivering a maximum of 4,650 kilonewtons of thrust, in the process simulating the complete burn time from liftoff to first stage separation, with no flight anomalies detected. Meanwhile, the Vega C's new second stage, now called the Sephiro 40, which replaces Vega's original Sephiro 23 second stage, successfully undertook a similar hot-fire test on the Mediterranean coast in southeastern Sardinia. The Vega C's third and fourth stages remain the same as on the original Vega launch system, and so they've already been flight proven. Additionally, aerodynamic and wind tunnel tests, vibration, structural and shock tests of the new launcher have now all been completed, verifying the design as well as the quality control of manufacturing and assembly processes. Computer flight simulations have confirmed that Vega C's flight hardware, software and subsystems are all working together as they should and are speaking with each other and with the modified ground support systems that they'll be using on the existing Vega Kourou launch complex. Now, as for the launch complex, it's had its mobile gantry cantilever reinforced, all platform shutters, a new mast sector and a new overhead travelling crane have also been installed. Compared to the existing Vega rocket, the new Vega C should be more economical to build and launch while carrying up to 700 kilograms more payload. It'll also be able to use a larger payload fairing, thereby allowing larger volume payloads. And there's a new multi-payload adapter and carrier system capable of launching 7 microsatellites and 35 CubeSats on a single flight. Also being planned is the new reusable Space Rider capsule, which is designed for use on payload return to Earth missions. ESA's Director of Space Transportation, Daniel Neunschwender, says work's also underway on a new Vega electrical nudge upper stage called Venus, which will provide the orbital transfer capability to satellites to extend its market reach with constellation deployment, lunar missions, and even in-orbit servicing. Today, we fly with non-European components, and at the end of the day, I want to be sure that the autonomous and independent sovereign access to space is 100% 100% European. We just uh, tested the Zephyro 40, which is uh, one of the stages of, uh, of Vega C. So today I'm happy to report that we, we tested basically all engines we have on Vega C. So the first point is certainly the first stage, the P120, which is uh, the first stage of uh, Vega C with regard to the small sister Vega. It's an increased uh, first stage, which gives more power. At the end, the performance uh, goes from 1.5 ton to 2.3 tons overall um, in terms of delivery to orbit. And I should add a second point, it is that this P120C is common with Ariane 6. So in fact, we optimize the production in Europe of the first stages, which will be used on both launches, Ariane 6 and Vega C. Coming back to to these marvelous and efficient uh, launchers, we have some uh, upper stages and you see a very important point immediately it is the volume under the fairing 
we have a much bigger fairing on Vega C. Uh, by the way, it is also a, uh, a fairing which is produced in, in, uh, in two parts only, which is also an enhancement in terms of production logic, but the customer doesn't care. The care, uh, customer cares about the volume under the fairing. He cares about the delivery into orbit, how, how precise you can deliver uh, your, your uh, satellite or satellites, and of course, what is the cost. So the third uh, key aspect is that uh, we drastically reduce the cost per kilogram with Vega C. That's Daniel Neunschwender, the Director of Space Transportation with the European Space Agency. And this is Space Time. Still to come, the new Expedition 63 crew have arrived safely aboard the International Space Station, and there's been another failure for SpaceX's new Starship. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The new Expedition 62 and 63 crew have arrived safely aboard the International Space Station following a rapid rendezvous four-orbit flight from Earth. Their Soyuz MS-16 spacecraft had launched just six hours earlier from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The mission was also the maiden man flight for Russia's new Soyuz 21A launch vehicle. Ground propellant feed has been terminated, so fuel and oxidizer are no longer being loaded into the vehicle. Ding confirmed. And right now the booster's fuel tanks are being pressurized. This helps to uh, just optimize and really facilitate the flow of the fuel. Also helps add a little bit of structural support to the rocket itself. We are inside two minutes to launch. And at this very moment, the International Space Station passing just overhead. At the moment of launch, though, it'll already be 587 statute miles ahead of the Soyuz spacecraft, flying just over northeast Kazakhstan. It just passed right over Pad 31 there at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Is he without board? Confirm. Base to ground. That first umbilical tower separating, that means we're 35 seconds away from launch. Launch. There goes the second tower, so we are 15 yeah. seconds away from launch. We're going to see the boosters at the bottom light up, and as their thrust build and lift off. Cassidy, Evanich, and Wagner on their way to the International Space Station. Fifteen seconds into the flight, all parameters are nominal. We confirm on board, all parameters are nominal. Twenty seconds into launch, um, thrusters are working nominally. The crew is feeling fine. 30 seconds. Thrusters are working nominally and the vehicle is nominal. Getting good continuous calls from the crew and the ground, everything with the vehicle looking nominal. The first stage powering the Soyuz upward, delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from the four strap on boosters in that single core engine. Roll and your at 60 minutes into flight. The yaw pitch roll, the attitude or which way it's pointing, hearing all those parameters or the status of it, nominal. 70 seconds into flight. Everything's fine with the vehicle on our side. We confirm we're feeling good. Again, this first stage going to continue to burn for just about two minutes into the flight, so just under a minute to go on the first stage. In the flight, uh, thrusters are working nominally. We confirm, and we're feeling well on board. So he's continuing to retreat and review, already traveling well in excess of 1,100 1, 100 miles per hour. We confirm. And seeing the Koryov cross there as those strap-on boosters separate, the first stage separating right on time. We also confirm lateral unit separation. Their job done. They drop weight at an altitude of about 28 statute miles. The Soyuz traveling at about 3,300 miles an hour. Vehicle stabilization is nominal. Everything's fine on board. And with the first stage in the launch escape tower, now jettison being powered by that second stage, the core stage. We confirm the jettisoning of the... No. The shroud jettisoning, the launch shroud has been jettisoned, so the Soyuz spacecraft now exposed. 70 seconds into flight, the vehicle is fine, and we are feeling well on board. This is Erkuti. Everything looking good with that core stage, the second stage. 90 minutes. 56 feet in length, 13 and a half in diameter, has a single engine with four fuel chambers, provides between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust, depending on their altitude, for its 3 minutes and 28 seconds of operation. Again, the second stage is going to continue to burn. We're looking for second stage shutdown at about 4 minutes, 30 seconds after launch. Parameters of the vehicle are nominal. 230 seconds into flight, the vehicle is stable. We copy and we confirm everything is um, nominal on board. So we're a little over four minutes since 
launch. Again, we're we'll looking for that shutdown and separation coming up. And as that separation occurs, the third stage will begin firing. It's called a hot stage technique. And that third stage will ignite while the second is still attached. We confirm separation of stage two. We see it as well. Everything's nominal on board. Copy. And we have confirmation second stage shutdown and separated in peace fly off. That was the third stage's lower skirt jettison. That was targeted to come off at four minutes, 56 seconds into launch. We're already past five minutes and 20 seconds. Third stage now going to continue to burn until we're at our orbital insertion. So the initial orbit of the Soyuz spacecraft that's expected uh, to come at about eight minutes and 46 seconds of at shutdown. And then the separation coming just four seconds later. Into flight and the thrusters are working nominally. So right now the Soyuz being propelled into orbit by the single engine of the third stage providing 67,000 pounds of thrust going to continue to burn until shut down. Your pitch and roll are all nominal. Copy. And we are feeling well on board. Still getting great updates from the crew. Anatole Evanation talking to the ground. Everyone feeling well on board. Yaw pitch, roll, the engines all performing nominally. That's the word we want to keep hearing. It means everything's going normally according to the plan. Six minutes, 35 seconds since liftoff. All control systems uh, for the vehicle are working nominally. Copy. And we just passed seven minutes and 30 seconds into this flight. Spacecraft velocity right around 13,500 miles an hour. 470 seconds into flight. Third stage thrusters are working nominally. Everything's well on board. The vehicle is stable. And we're standing by. Our next major milestone is going to be the shutdown of that third stage coming in about 20 seconds from now. Thank you for your support. 510 seconds into flight. Your pitch and roll are all nominal. Get ready for the stage separation. So we'll see the engines cut off, and once the vehicle separates, it usually gives the crew a bit of a jolt. Then the Soyuz will be flying free. We see the third stage separating, and we can see it dropping away now. Third stage separation confirmed. And congratulations, guys. You are in orbit. I am handing you over to the Mission Control, Moscow. Solar array deployed. We have confirmation along with what's known as the appendages, all of the antennas, so the rendezvous and the communication antennas all deployed on the Soyuz spacecraft. The Russian Federal Space Agency at Oscosmos took extra precautions for this mission, including very strict quarantine procedures to protect the crew during training and pre-flight preparations because of the global COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. The Soyuz capsule docked automatically onto the Russian Poisk port attached to the orbiting outpost Zvezda module as both spacecraft were flying at 28,000 kilometres per hour, some 419 kilometres above the Atlantic Ocean. Now they're inside 30 metres, continuing to close in on Poisk. 15 metres visually, uh, rate 0.1. 10 metres, rate is 0.1. 8 meters approximately, uh, range rate is 0 0.1, 6 meters, range visual estimate is 3 meters, copy, contact, sending by for contact, contact confirmed, hooks engaged at uh, 17.13.21, copy. And docking confirmed, 9.13 a.m. Central Time, 10.13 a.m. Eastern Time, 14.13 GMT, as the station was flying just about 260 statute miles over the northern Atlantic. Soyuz MS-16 spacecraft docked to the International Space Station. Right now, the docking probe is going to begin to retract. It's going to pull it in, and the hooks are going to start to drive on both the station and on the docking port, uh, the Poise module. Please select SSVP docking and internal transfer system display on input to control panel. But with that, Chris Cassidy, Anatoly Ivanishin, and Yvonne Wagner's voyage to the International Space Station is complete. They've arrived. This is the hooks engaged. Time, 17, 13, 21. The new crew will replace three members of the current Expedition 61-62 crew who will return to Earth aboard their Soyuz MS-13 spacecraft on April the 17th. The Dragon 1 capsule has returned to Earth for the very last time. 
SpaceX mission Ceres-20 splashdown in the North Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California, marked the end of NASA's first commercial resupply services contract and the retirement of SpaceX's first-generation Dragon cargo ships. All of NASA's SpaceX missions, both manned and unmanned, will now be undertaken by the new next-generation Dragon 2 spacecraft. For its return to Earth, Ceres-20 carried some two tons of return scientific experiments, as well as equipment needing maintenance or upgrades. Ceres-20 had launched on March the 6th aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. The mission was the third flight for the same Dragon capsule, which had previously flown on both the Ceres-10 mission in February 2017 and Ceres-16 in December 2018. Over its three missions, it spent a total of 100 days in space, delivering more than 43,000 kilograms of supplies and equipment to the space station, and it returned some 33,000 kilograms of completed experiments and equipment back to Earth. As well as SpaceX, NASA also uses Northrop Grumman and their Antares rocket to fly Cygnus cargo ships to the space station. And from next year... SpaceX and Northrop Grumman will be joined by Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser space plane, which will also carry supplies to the orbiting outpost, flying up there aboard the United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan Centaur rocket. SpaceX's latest prototype Starship test article, SN3, has experienced a major failure, collapsing during a pressurised cryogenic fuel test. The test was designed to determine if the new prototype could hold fuel at extremely low temperatures right before liftoff. SpaceX boss Elon Musk tweeted that the failure may have been caused by a test configuration mistake with some of the valves, resulting in leaking at cryogenic temperatures. The issue caused SN3 stainless steel dome to crumple like a soda can before toppling over in a cloud of vapour. It was all very reminiscent of SpaceX's SN1 prototype, which experienced a similar fate, collapsing during a pressure test earlier this year. Work's already underway on another prototype, SN4. Starships being designed to carry up to 100 people or 100 tonnes of cargo on long-duration interplanetary missions. It'll actually operate as the second stage of a new reusable heavy-lift launch system now being developed by SpaceX. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. The credibility of the World Health Organization is coming under growing scrutiny following their strong support for China's propaganda line over the COVID-19 coronavirus cover-up. There are growing calls for China to be sued over Beijing's initial denials and cover-ups, delaying notification of the spread of the outbreak, delaying notification of the first human-to-human transmission of the virus, and hiding the true extent of the outbreak. The first case of COVID-19 is now known to have occurred on November the 17th. That's a month earlier than previously claimed. In fact, more than 200 people were already infected by early December, with the first human-to-human transmission of the deadly virus occurring sometime around mid-December. However, formal notification by China to the World Health Organization didn't take place until December the 31st, by which time more than 5 million people from the center of the outbreak in Wuhan had already left the area and traveled to other parts of China and from there to the rest of the world. China says the virus has claimed some 3,300 lives, arresting or disappearing doctors, journalists and other citizens who contradict the official Chinese Communist Party line. However, doctors and local Wuhan funeral homes say the true death toll is more likely around 42,000. But instead of trying to get to the truth of the whole matter, the World Health Organization has repeatedly been stating that it appreciates the commitment from China's top leadership to fighting the disease and the transparency Beijing's demonstrated over the virus. That comes despite studies showing some 95% of deaths globally from COVID-19 could have been prevented if China had been honest with the rest of the world. The World Health Organization was still downplaying the idea that COVID-19 was a pandemic in February, even though the virus had already spread to Italy, South Korea and Spain, where thousands had died. By March the 6th, more than 3,400 people had died globally, and there were new infections in seven countries, with the virus now present in some 90 countries globally. But the World Health Organization waited until March the 12th to label the coronavirus a pandemic by which time more than 11,000 people were infected in Italy, 7,000 in South Korea, and more than 1,000 in the United States. 
Currently, more than 1.6 million people are infected with the COVID-19 virus, and well over 100,000 people have now died from the disease. China's growing influence in the United Nations and its medical arm, the World Health Organization, is a key strategy of Beijing's Belt and Roads Initiative, which provides funding for major infrastructure projects for third world countries at crippling interest rates, forcing those nations to kowtow to Beijing's demands. The World Health Organization's Director General Tedros Adhanom Debrisis, who is not a doctor by the way, has praised China's actions in relation to COVID-19, claiming Beijing set a new standard for outbreak control, which has bought the world time. Tedros, who is the former Ethiopian health minister, won the coveted World Health Organization post after China backed him in the May 2017 election. And that's interesting because Ethiopia has taken a massive Belt and Road Initiative loan from China, estimated to be worth some $12.1 billion, constituting half of the African nation's total foreign debt. And one of the first warnings that things weren't quite right in the World Health Organization anymore happened in 2019, and we reported it on this program, when the organization formally supported the use of so-called Chinese traditional medicines, even though they have absolutely no scientifically proven benefits and pose a major threat to many of the world's most endangered species. Heart specialists have called on patients to continue taking their prescribed medications for high blood pressure following discovery of a link between heightened risk of COVID-19 and heart issues. Writing in the Medical Journal of Australia, they've suggested that doctors should conservatively treat issues with the heart and that they should defer invasive procedures until after the virus has passed. Scientists have issued a new warning that global warming could cause rapid destruction of ecosystems within the current decade. The findings reported in the journal Nature are based on data from over 30,000 plant and animal species. Researchers looked at when different populations were likely to be pushed beyond their thermal limits. They found that if greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise at their current rates, these local thresholds could be reached by 2030 in tropical oceans and by 2050 in tropical forests and higher latitudes. However, the authors conclude that the wide-scale disruption of ecosystems could still be avoided, but only if global warming can be kept under 2 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. A new study claims having thick thighs may save lives. A report in the journal Endocrine Connections claims a higher thigh circumference may be linked with lower blood pressure and a reduced risk of heart attack in people with obesity. The study investigated overweight and obese people, finding a correlation between larger thigh circumference and lower blood pressure. These findings suggest that carrying more weight on the thighs may be a marker of better heart health in obese and overweight people, who are at generally greater risk of having a heart attack. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audioboom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 